When she first brought home the iron skillet, no one questioned her sudden culinary skills, except for maybe her mother. Honestly, Katrina, I don't understand what's gotten into you. I've never seen you express one whit of interest in food. It was also her mother who commented on her weight. Honestly, Katrina, with these fancy meals you effortlessly whip up, I don't know how you stay so skinny. Do I need to worry about an eating disorder? She patted her stomach. Where these extra five pounds are all on you. And her mother, who months later lamented, Honestly, Katrina, you look downright skeletal. It's like your weight is slothing off on me. Frankly, she paused, lowering her voice. It's like you are plumping us up like chickens. Maybe consider lightening the feed? She winked. In the meantime, be a dear and warm us up a little of the burning from last night. Katrina stared down at the overly robed cheeks, her mother, too, still to be sleeping. This coffin, the third, she bowed over in as many months, her eyes too numb for tears, her heart too hollowed out for pain. The doors of the cathedral opened, liberating a breeze that wisped against her cheek. Her mother's voice caressed. Honestly, Katrina, I think you fed me to death. Six months earlier, when her grandmother died, it fell to Katrina to clean out her house so it could be put up for sale. Their part-time job as a waitress and full-time job as an aspiring illustrator, everyone in her family assumed she had the free time to make it happen. It was a rainy Tuesday afternoon, and the closets under the eaves smelled like cedar and wet leaves. Her back ached from ducking the tight spaces, and her nose were dust and crumbling carcasses of insects. Rubbing her back, she scooted out of the closet and fell on the nearest twin bed. Cat cocked her head as she studied her progress. A sole worker in this establishment, she determined that anything deemed worthy of selling was her profit to keep. An assortment of personal items caught her fancy, her favorite, a paperback book of photographs of women from the 60s, fishing top a gag for her brother's stocking come Christmas. The sky deepened as she took load after load down the narrow staircase, frequently knocking her knuckles against the walls as she navigated the precarious incline. She forced herself to do one last sweep to make sure she hadn't missed anything. Flashlight in hand, she commenced an inspection of the upstairs attic room. The temperature had dropped, and she shivered. Although she'd never admitted to her siblings, Kat always felt a bit creeped out by the closets with their gaping orifices, open on either side of the twin beds the two halves of a mouth, about to close and swallow its inhabitants. Without her grandmother's presence, the house felt starved. With a sigh of determination, Kat entered the room, flipping a switch that didn't light. She stepped over the first closet, shining her beam empty. Kat pushed the tapestry of the other closet aside, mind contemplating takeout options. When she swept a light along the dark recesses of a corner, a patch of shadow glimmered. Following, she scurried under the flap to take a closer look. She crouched down, positioning the light to shine in the corner. She crawled to the spot, reaching out. She touched cool metal. She wrapped her hands around outstretched length and tugged. It clanged against the boards as it bounced over to her. The heft too much for one arm. Had her dragging it while she collected her flashlight and fell back onto the carpet of the room. She took a deep breath, studying the object on her lap. A cast iron skillet, light from her touch, absorbed to the flat black surface and reflected back a kaleidoscope of color. When she turned over the skillet, property of Cook appeared stamped into the metal. An odd name. She looked forward to looking it up on the internet when she got home. Hunger gnawed. Could she cook tonight? Her mouth watered as her mind rifled through various concoctions. She laughed, remembering the failed romantic dinner she'd burned for her ex. She cradled the coal metal to her chest. An idea was forming around us. Grilled cheese. Her belly gurgled, and she hauled her find downstairs. As she locked up, she planned her list for the store. When she got home, she knocked on Barry's door. He lived a couple units over. Well, this is a surprise, he grinned. I'm making dinner. You interested? His smile deepened. Kit Kat, I've never known you to cook. Is this a euphemism for something more nefarious? Cat rolled her eyes. Maybe, if you're lucky. But I'm serious about the food. You win? How can I refuse? He ran a hand down his thick braid. What can I bring to drink? At the deli, she picked up half a loaf of uncut multigrain bread, blue cheese, smoked uncured bacon, beef steak, tomato, basil, and a sweet onion she planned on caramelizing in honey and butter. You wouldn't by any chance have a pale ale or IPA, would you? My, you are full of surprises this evening. I'll see what I can do and be right over. Cat became enchanted with the thrill of something new. Elements of spice, herb, 
and ingredient culture, much like a mysterious Aldergain door where a persimmon rose birthing, a fairy princess, roof scent threads of saffron, pearlescent sheets of a spring onion, or the transfiguration of grey meat to bronze perfection lured her like a sailor to the sea. She started with easy meals like erotic scrambles but soon found herself crafting soups and complex sauces. With increasing frequency, her table was full of friends eager to share her creations. Barry was the first to offer up his belly as an official taste tester, but he certainly wasn't the only one. Her mind processed ingredients, diet preferences, and allergies. With the efficiency of a calculator computing algebraic equations, she conspired with three different bakers, knew a local butcher by name, and became friends with the owners of her favorite farmer's market stalls. All found their way to her table. Katrina worked in a frenzy, painting, cooking, and hosting, so much so that regardless of how decadence her meals, weight started to melt off her frame. She found herself digging through her closet for items that hadn't fit in years. One night, as Kat fell into her nest of a bed in that delicious in-between place before falling asleep, she found herself concocting a muffin recipe a couple of her co-workers from the restaurant had been over for a meal and bragged her cooking rivaled the me, the head chef at their five-star establishment. Ever since he heard the rumors, He's been harassing her to bring something in. The problem was her real inspiration revolved around things that could be cooked with a black pan. Yet, as she fell asleep, a breakfast muffin evoking the seasons percolated, dissipating into an endless abyss of night. She floated in darkness without time, until sweat bathed, she awoke. She stammered into the kitchen to make coffee, and discovered a strange item sitting on top of her stove. A muffin tin. The shade so dark it sucked the sunlight from the room. She ran her fingers across the smooth, opalescent surface. Lifting it took two hands, and on the bottom, she read the same strange imprint, property of Kook. Upon bringing the frying pan home, she did a brief search on her computer, but couldn't trace any company information about the brand name. She lost interest. Now though, somehow, she inherited a companion piece, probably a gift from Barry. He did, after all, have a key to her place, and both time and resources to find other pieces from the set. She grinned and threw on her coat and shoes, eager to rush to the store. Her seasons of change muffin wouldn't make itself. When she'd mentioned to Jenna she was bringing a treat to Damien, she hadn't expected people who weren't on shift to show up. Top hairy animals crawled up the wall, trialing trails of ivy. Branches intertwined overhead, concealing tiny spotlights illuminating each table while leaving the surrounding space in shadow. The decor was crafted to create the illusion of, of picnicking in a forest. The intimate space only had room for 30 guests, and it felt like she had an audience. If you all weren't here because of me, are you? I certainly didn't bring enough to feed the herd of you. Jenna stepped forward. We can't wait to witness Damien's reaction. We're dying to see what you brought. Damien stood in the open doorway leading to the kitchen, his pristine chef whites crisp and stretched. Am I smelling something for me? He waved forward, I don't have all day. Kat sat her bag down on a verdant velvet seat and carried her basket over to him. She peeled off the kitchen towel, revealing the still warm muffins. I think it's best if you take a bite, incorporating the top of the muffin to the very bottom. The crown had a slight pink color enhanced with speckled blush glaze. The room fell silent as Damien picked one up. Inhaling deeply, he opened his mouth wide and took a bite. His eyes closed. Cat laughed. I know, right? What is this? Damien asked after he swallowed. An idea I had before I slept last night. I wanted all four seasons in one solitary bite. It starts with summer. A strawberry basil glaze, he asked. Yes. I used almond flour and paste to make the first half of the base to, to illustrate the nutty warmth of fall. And, he continued for her, pieces of traditional sour apple rolled in with each bite, cinnamon to represent winter in the center, followed by coconut flour infused with rhubarb to symbolize spring. He appraised her. I have to have this recipe. Did you use a particular pan? You have no idea how particular, she thought, as she remembered the mysterious delivery left on her counter. I did. Any chance I could borrow it for my mother's birthday brunch? These would be a highlight. Cat flushed with pleasure at the compliment. Sure, but I want my name on the menu. And a table for me and my mom. Done. He moved to go. 
but turned back to gently pry the basket from her arm before making his escape back into his lair. They sat in a window seat framed in fresh flowers, her mother, her mother elegant in pearls, in a cream sheath. Cat observed her closely as she bit into the muffin. For a brief moment, her mother's gold-flecked eyes widened. Cat couldn't wait any longer. And, magical, her mother licked her lips. It's as if I traveled the globe in one bite. Damien is quite the catch. Have you considered dating him? Damien didn't come up with the recipe. I did. Cat pointed at the menu. Look, I even have a chef credit to prove it. She ground her teeth in an effort to keep a natural expression on her face. Honestly, Katrina, you're telling me you're a chef now? What happened to illustrating? Her mom smiled as she said it, but there was an undercurrent of mirth below her words. Cat willed her eyes not to roll. I'm still an artist, only my subject matter has metamorphosed. Why am I not surprised? Her mother kept picking at the pastry, tearing bites and eating them. So what is it now? Portraits of food. You should come over and I'll show you. Cat wished her mother would join her for a meal and look at her work. Her mother gazed at her candidly. Katrina, should I be concerned about your fixation on food when you look skinnier than I've ever seen you in quite some time? Are you eating? Obviously, Mom. I couldn't create recipes without tasting them. I think I finally found my passion. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. She glanced down at her plate, the muffin gone. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. What has gotten into me? You came up with that? Cat grinned. Yes. And it's all thanks to Grandma's skillet. Her mother's eyes narrowed. Your grandmother wasn't known for her cooking skills. Huh. Well, maybe it was just a family heirloom. It's definitely old. I found it hidden away in the back of a closet. Hmm. Her mom's considering stare smoothed into a smirk. When can I be invited over for dinner? Over the months, Kate's inspiration grew. One of her friends brought in an acquaintance who worked at an art gallery and insisted on showing her work to his boss. She was going to have her very first exhibition in a small but well-respected gallery. Damien hoarded the baking pan, always making excuses as to why he couldn't return it. He incorporated muffins, cupcakes, and popovers into his daily mix of menu offerings. Her life flowed like a movie, and if she was a little tired each morning from being consumed by caramel ribbons of fire, well, it was the price of any overly imaginative mind. Now her mom was a frequent visitor and often stayed late helping to clean up. Their relationship grew in the way she has always yearned. Everything in her world was perfect until Josie came to town. Banging on the door brought Kate out of a fog state. She's been trying to mix the right intensity of indigo for the garlic spear she was painting. I'm coming, she yelled. It sounded like someone had brought a battering ram. Cat wiped paint on her pants before grasping the handle. On the other side stood Josie. They both stared at each other for a full minute before she spoke. Jesus Christ, Cat, are you on a new diet? Josie, this is unexpected. Her ex traveled for work. Enough that it had impacted their relationship. And after two years of dating, they broke it off. Josie reached out and touched her collarbone. Seriously, Cat? It looks like you are going for heroin, chick. She tamped down the warmth that trickled from that touch. Cat pulled back. I'm fine. I'm only in town for a few days. May I come in? Cat opened the door wider and gestured for her to enter. Josie stood in the middle of the room, looking at the paintings stacked against the wall. What happened to your furniture? I moved it. I needed the space. I can see that, Josie frowned. Her perk nose twitched in a way that made a cat always think of soft, fluffy rabbits. I stopped by the restaurant last night. I read about Damien's pastries in the paper. It sounded like his style, so naturally I had to see it for myself. The crab center with the aioli glaze was enough to make me come. Jenna told me that it was you who got him started. Me, or possibly one of the pans I found while cleaning out my grandma's house. I'm so sorry to hear that she has passed. Yeah, me too. Can I offer you something to drink? Sure, once they settled at the table, both with infused iced teas of nectarine and fresh mint, Kat chose to speak her mind. So what brings you by? It hurt to see Josie, and she knew she wasn't hers anymore. After talking to Jenna last night, it seems like a lot has changed. I tried calling, but Kat chuckled. Yeah, I'm consistently misplacing my phone, and I've turned off the ringer, so I'm not interrupted during a creative spell. A key sounded in the lock, and they both jumped. The door opened and Barry strolled in, arms full of groceries. Cat went to help him. Barry glanced from Cat to Josie. Sorry, I wasn't aware you had company. I didn't want to disturb your work. He tilted his head. Josie? Hey Barry. Josie's tone cooled. I'll leave you to it then. Dinner at 8 tonight? Perfect. Cat could cut the awkward tension in the room with her palette knife. 
Thanks for shopping for me today. She gave him a peck on the cheek to annoy Josie. He shot the peace sign at Josie before heading out. What is going on here? Josie demanded. What do you mean? You don't get to walk out of my life, then walk back in and be judgmental. Cat, are you blind? The man looks morbidly ill. Cat shook her head in confusion. You should be buying him groceries, not the other way around. Is he sick? Taking too many drugs? You know he's in recovery. Are you sure about that? Of course I'm sure. He's my friend. I see him every day. He helps me with dinner. He's been present in my life, unlike some people. Josie studied Cat. Okay, I guess I deserve that. But this has been hard on me too. She reached out her hand to touch the tips of Cat's fingers. Cat wanted to relent, to take Josie in her arms, to show her what she'd been up to. How she spent her time after the breakup, as she wasn't sure her heart could take the rejection. Are you doing anything tonight? Why don't you come over? Get here early and you can help me prep. Say six. I've got to finish this. She paused, indicating to the giant vegetable before continuing. I have an art exhibit coming up. Josie's face lit up. Oh, Cat, that's wonderful. I've always knew you were batshit talented. Their eyes locked. But Cat glanced away first and walked over to the door. So, tonight? Josie nodded. Can't wait. Cat watched Josie pace about the room. Throughout the dinner, Josie became increasingly antsy. Why couldn't she enjoy herself like everyone else? When Barry left, Josie practically slammed the door behind him. She took a deep breath and scrutinized Kate. What do you think of dinner? Cat asked. She made a seafood cassoulet with fresh mussels, clams, and copper river salmon, which had been caught that morning. Josie walked to the table and pulled out a chair for Cat before taking a seat herself. Cat, we've got to talk. Okay, but could you come right out and just say you hated the meal? Damn it, Cat, the meal is great, but you can't see what's going on right in front of you. What are you talking about? Not a single person at your table appeared healthy. Your mother was puffy with chub, which is far from the share I knew. Barry looks like he's close to turning sideways to waddle through your door. Not to mention his skin is sickly and shallow. The only person who seemed remotely robust was the fisherman Barry invited. But he hasn't been coming to your soirees, has he? What does that have to do with anything? Why can't you be happy for me, Cat? Cat stood. Look around you. Something is seriously off. Since when do you cook like a Michelin chef? Everyone's gorging like mosquitoes ready to lay eggs. Your friends have put on weight. Yet, you can't keep any on. Don't you wonder about your sudden obsession with food? I think you should go. Cat, open your eyes. Something's seriously not right. It's the pan. Isn't that what you said earlier? You found the pans and suddenly became inspired? Seriously, Josie, leave. Anger seethed under the surface of her skin. How dare she try to ruin all Cat worked to build. Josie stood, going to the coat rack for her purse. She turned suddenly and grabbed Kate's wrist. If you don't believe me, can you promise to take Barry to a doctor? Get him checked out? Cat yanked her arm away. Since when do you care about Barry? Jesus, Cat, I don't, but obviously you do. Wake up to what's going on around you. Take a break from cooking with that stupid pan you're obsessed with. What if you're the one poisoning everyone around you? Have you bothered to research your magical pan at all? If it's so bad, then why is the restaurant so popular? Why are my dinner parties so successful? Josie shook her head. I don't know, Cat, but maybe you should find out. Damien died first, a sudden cardiac arrest. When he collapsed, he was pulling her pan out of the oven. The skin melted off his face like butter. Before anyone realized he was down, his casket was closed. Unable to stomach stepping foot in his restaurant, Damien's sister hosted the wake at her home. Mira was his behind-the-scenes business manager. Kat has never met her. She found Mira sitting in her kitchen, head clutched between her palms. I'm so sorry about Damien. The words fell flat. Her grief was all-encompassing, but her expression of it felt as meaningless as sentiment written on toilet paper. Mira glanced up. Your cat, right? Surprised, Cat nodded. Mira's visceral hiss startled her. You're the one who started this ridiculous fixation. Cat sat back, face heating with embarrassment. Mira stared at Cat. Those damn baked goods he compulsively cooked in that ugly pan of it. Mira stopped talking about new recipes, concocting original flavors. Always bringing his inventions to the house. Obsessing about being the best. Always sampling, nibbling, eating. She scowled at the table. Cat's eyes rested on a family photo hanging on the wall. From the kid's ages, it looked like it had been taken about a year earlier, revealing a much slimmer mirror. A prickly chill cooled her, pulled her sweater tight. I don't know your plans for the restaurant. Oh, we'll have to close. That was Damien's dream, trailed off as a tear trickled down her cheek. Before you sell anything off, I was hoping to grab my pan. Mira peered up in disbelief. Cat rushed on. I'm not in a hurry or anything, but I wouldn't want to lose it. It was my grandmother's. Mia studied her for a long moment before responding, You're welcome to your devil pan. When she hadn't seen Barry for a few days, Cat began to fret. She was picking up her mail when another neighbor told her about his ambulance ride. 
Pat hurried to the hospital. When she arrived in his room, she couldn't reconcile the figure on the bed with her berry. The cinnamon skin was blotchy and pallid. The long raven hair, the pride and joy of his heritage, hung in limp, greasy clumps. When he opened his eyes, brought yolks were revealed. Pat became afraid. Hey, Kit Kat, the voice raspy, like it hadn't been used in months, not days. Barry, why didn't you call me? I would have been here in an instant. I put her hand over his, clasping it gently. Ah, uh, I didn't want to trouble you, he asked, a dry cough. What happened? A sad smile touched his lips. I guess my hard living in the old days caught up with me. But you're not old. Apparently, pancreatic cancer isn't picky about age. Oh, Barry, no. Tears burst from her eyes. Don't you worry, I'm going to beat this. I just need a little TLC. Maybe you could bring me some consomme? No, it fixed me right up. Kat desperately wanted to believe him. She chopped, simmered, and poured all of her love into the broth. It didn't fix him up. Barry was dead within the week after her mother's funeral. Kat gutted her painting, taking a knife from her butcher block. She stabbed at the swollen fruits and vegetables. The air in the apartment became vicious. The rancid decay spilling from their seam, redolent of the sulfur from her nightmares. She snapped wooden frames across her knees, utilizing a mallet, and the bruises became too much. When she was calm enough to think, Kat moved to her computer. Couldn't shake Josie's words, ricocheting throughout her head as she poisoned the very people she loved. She needed to find a way to jettison the pans and stop this from happening to anyone else. At first, she thought she might be able to melt the metal, but the internet won't here without a forge. It wasn't possible. She grabbed various keys off the counter. She owned a vintage bottle green Ford Thunderbird and had asked Kat to keep an eye on things until he came back. It took two trips because of their weight. She got into the car. She opted for a remote beach that Barry had introduced her to. A few hours away. On her drive, she stopped at a hardware store to pick up a sledgehammer and work gloves. All through the trip, her gut raged and screamed with hunger. Everything from sear scallops, Coco Vaughn, and an innovative take on Gateau Saint Anne assaulted her mind. She visualized Barry's unnatural eyes, her mother's unrecognizable face, and Damien's closed casket. To keep herself from driving to the grocery store and heading back home, when she got to the beach, the waves splintered with the sky and shore, one monotonous shades of grey, wind blue, shoving against her as she hauled the pans out of her car. The dead logs scattered at the high tide line. It took some time to break down the baking instruments into shards. She felt small enough to be tossed into the ocean. The brittle metal proved no match for her grief. Rain fell from the clouds, making the hammer and shard slick. She often missed her target. Several times she had to sit down and rest, her arms burning with unaccustomed effort. As the sky darkened and the tide rose, her hunger finally abated. Piece by piece, she hurled the remains into the crashing sea, eating the names of those she lost, promising never to forget the words. She slept dreamlessly in her car, exhaustion pulling her down as surely as the tide sucked the remnants of the skillet and muffin tent. Cat woke with the sunrise, amazed at how the sun brought out the blue of the sea, khaki of the sand, and the cerulean of the sky. Her hands itched from her paints, reminding her in a flash of the work she shredded at home. She considered the pieces hanging at the gallery. All the pieces sold. She frowned, losing the more field thread of thought instead of the neon brilliance. 24 hour driving she how the road took its place. She started the car and drove off the ocean in her rear. Nathan watched the dirt swirl as he kicked the small shells littering the beach. Mom's boyfriend was okay. He'd give him five bucks to buy something. There is gas and guzzle. However, finding they would find a way which tainted the fun of spending. He often wished he had a brother or sister to boss for him. In fact, he would take green boss if that's what it took not to be so lonely. His converse left prints in the wet sand. He was about to turn around. Something caught his eye. Flooding down, he saw an unusual black pebble sticking out of the sand. Getting on his hands and knees, he dug around the object until he discovered it wasn't a rock at all. It was a toy soldier. Further along the shore, he spied little dark objects green the sand. He ran along the shoreline, collecting as many as he could. He pulled his red sweatshirt into a basket, using it to collect his find. When he could no longer outrun the waves, he grabbed a bundle tight against his chest. He walked up the beach, soft dry sand, grizzled sea grass grew. Sitting on a small slope, he studied his treasures. The obsidian figures were made of heavy dark metal that twinkled with different colors depending on how he turned them in the sun. They were unlike any of the cheap green soldiers his friends had. He boasted both men and women, posed not only with weapons, but like real people, taking their leisure. Each soldier was intricately designed with fine details. A 
the creases around one man's eyes, or the delicate ash dangling from a half-smoked cigarette. None of them had the same face. He squinted his eyes. He almost thought he could detect subtle movement. The bright joy of imagination filled him. The metal warmed his hands, and he knew he'd discovered something special. And by expansion, he was special too. He stood, filling his sweatshirt pocket with his cash, excited to show his friend Mika. In his hand, he held one lone soldier, transfixed by the swirling eddies of color. Located on the bottom base, he found a small stamp. Peering at the tiny type, he read, Property of Tana, 